excited to see you and I'm glad that you are here. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit today about um, something I think is very interesting, which is the ancient Egyptians. Does everybody know where Egypt is? Tell me in the chat if you know where Egypt is. Anybody? I hope you do. Egypt is in Africa, okay? And um, the ancient Egyptians um, did a lot of amazing things. And this was a very, very long time ago. So I'm gonna read to you today about Egypt and what the Egyptians did and how they helped us today. So my book is called The Genius of the Ancient Egyptians. All right, innovations from past civilizations. Innovations are like discoveries. Um, it's about new technology and things that they discovered and came up with. Yes, mummies were, uh, were something that they definitely did. And we'll learn about that today. All right, has anybody learned about ancient Egypt in school? Tell me in the chat if you have learned about ancient Egypt in school. Oh, okay, Yolanda has, that's great. Um, there's a lot to learn about ancient Egypt. Oh, Henry has too, wonderful. Okay, so can everybody see my book? Oh, good, Nina also. Can everybody see my book? I wanna make sure that I'm sharing it so that everyone can see it. Good, all right. So, the ancient Egyptians. Who were the Egyptians? People began to live along the banks of the Nile River in Egypt around 9,000 years ago. Can you imagine 9,000 years ago? As time passed, these small groups of hunters and fishers began to settle and grow crops. Uh, in turn, these farming communities grew into villages and towns. Systems of trade developed and by 3000 BC, a civilization had been established that would become one of the greatest in the world. Ancient Egypt, Egyptian history is generally divided into three kingdoms, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. The, Egypt, the Egyptian civilization flourished during the years of these kingdoms. The time periods between the kingdoms were, the, um, were years of weaker rule when there was fighting and unrest in Egypt. Okay, so can we see my map here? And this is the map, here's Asia, and here's Africa, and they're kind of right between, right? And you're right, not too far from Rome. Here's Italy over here. All right, the rulers of Egypt were called pharaohs. They showed their power and wealth by building impressive temples and pyramids to honor themselves and the many gods they worshiped. For more than 2,500 years, great pharaohs such as Khufu, Hatshepsut, and Ramses II ruled over a prosperous land. Throughout this time, the Egyptians sometimes had to fight neighboring peoples, um, such as the Nubians and the Assyrians, but Egypt's desert location kept it fairly safe from the, um, from the invaders. And for the most part, life was the same there for centuries. Eventually in 30 BC, this great civilization fell under control of the Romans. The ancient Egyptians left behind a huge legacy of information. This is contained in many different artifacts from palaces and temples to paintings, hieroglyphics, and even dead bodies. So this big picture right here, it's wall paintings such as this one from the tomb of Setel, uh, named for a high ranking Egyptian, reveal much about the lifestyle and beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. So they, they made these cave pan these paintings and they're very beautiful and they have lasted for thousands of years. All right. Here's one of the coolest things I think they did, the pyramids. The ancient Egyptians are most famous for building the pyramids. More than a hundred of these structures have been found in Egypt. But the day, in the days before cranes and other modern building equipment, 
How were the Egyptians able to construct such mighty monuments? How do you think they built these things that are so tall without having any power tools or trucks? Pyramids were huge tombs built as the final resting place for pharaohs or other important people. Inside were many different rooms, including storerooms and bedrooms, decorated with paintings or engraved with prayers and stories. The pyramid shape represented the sun's rays shining down from the sky. The largest pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza, was built for the pharaoh Khufu. When completed in 2560 BC, it stood more than 480 feet, which is 146 meters high and contained around 2.3 million blocks of stone. Can you imagine 146 meters high, how tall that is? How would they climb up there and build that? Ancient Egyptian art, um, art architects chose the position of a pyramid carefully. For example, they might make sure that it lined up with the sunrise on a certain day of the year. They also designed the pyramid to protect both the Pharaoh's body and the treasures inside the tomb. Fake entrances were included to fool robbers. Inside was a maze of passageways, false doors, and litter-filled rooms to confuse anyone who managed to get in. So this picture is a corridor inside the tomb of two royal servants. Um, it's located in Saqqara. Stone for the pyramids mostly came from a nearby quarry. The huge blocks were cut and then hauled on sleds across the desert. Once at the building site, the blocks were added to the pyramid using a system of ramps they made of mud. As the pyramids got higher, the ramps were lengthened and widened to keep them stable. To fill the gaps and smooth the surface, finishing blocks made of limestone were added. Very early pyramids were built with, built with stepped sides. Do you think the step sides would be easier to build or harder to build than the smooth sides? What do you guys think? Tell me in the chat. What do you think would be harder? The smooth ones, like the ones here on the left, or the stepped ones? Smooth one is harder? I think so too. I think so too. They also made these beautiful temples. Religion was very important to the ancient Egyptians, and they worshiped many gods. They believe a temple was the home to the god or goddess it was dedicated to, so it was very a very important place. Priests performed special ceremonies and rituals to honor the gods and to keep them happy. People brought offerings to the temples made to the gods. The temple complex made at Karnak is one of the biggest religious sites ever built. The city of temples covers an area larger than 180 football fields. Can you believe how big that is? Four huge statues guard the entrance to the rock carved temple at Abu Simbel. Look at these statues. Aren't they amazing? Temples outside and in. Some temples, such as the temples at Luxor, were built from stone blocks. Others, such as those at Abu Simbel, were carved out of solid rock. Inside the temple were huge stone pillars to support the heavy roof. The walls were covered with carvings and paintings. The art often told tales of the Pharaoh's great victories and showed them um, in the company of the gods. All right, now, this right here, this tall skinny thing is called an obelisk. Obelisks were tall four-sided pillars that were placed in pairs on either side of the entrance of a temple. They narrowed from a wide base to a pyramid shape at the top. An obelisk was usually created from a single huge piece of granite, and they were enormously heavy. No one knows exactly how the Egyptians raised them up once they had been carved. Obelisks were important, um, were associated with the sun god Ra. The ancient Egyptians believed that he existed within these stone pillars. All right, to avoid hauling heavy stone obelisks a long way, they were usually created at quarries on the banks of the Nile River. Specially built boats carried the obelisks along the river to the temple site. Why do you think they wanted to put them on 
the boats. Why was that important? Does anybody know why they would put them on boats? Maybe, like it said, they were so heavy and they couldn't carry them. So they had to float them on the water. All right. The Egyptians also used writing. The ancient Egyptians wanted to record important events in their world. To do this, they became one of the first civilizations to develop their language into a form of writing. In fact, the amazing Egyptians created several systems of writing, including hieroglyphics and heretic. Picture writing. At first, the Egyptians used pictures to represent objects. As this form of writing developed, it, be, it began to include more abstract shapes, which represented certain sounds. Having these additional symbols meant that people could write down such things as names or, and ideas. These pictures and symbols are known as hieroglyphics, which comes from the Greek word for sacred carving. So this picture at the bottom is the name of a royal person in an oval with a line at one end called a cartouche. This cartouche is from the temple of Luxor. Can we tell anything about this person maybe from their name? What do you think this would mean? Do you see any symbols in here that would look like anything to you? I see this right here. Let me, um, I'm going to draw a little bit here. So what about this thing? What does that look like to you? Anything that I circled? Does anybody have an idea? Maybe it's an animal. So, oh, it could be a hamster. I bet it was a big animal. I bet that even though they drew it little, it was big. And it maybe a lion, maybe a sphinx. So. Do you think maybe that mean, it could mean that this person was very brave and mighty like a lion, or it could mean that they loved animals? What do you think? Do you see anything else in there that might tell us something about them? I see something that looks like, could this be a snake? I think maybe that could be a snake. I don't know. All right, joining things up. Alongside hieroglyphics, the Egyptians developed a cursive or joined up form of writing called heretic. The word means priestly writing and it was called this because it was mainly used for religious texts. Heretic was much quicker to write than hieroglyphics, especially as it was usually written in ink on papyrus rather than carved on stone. Unlike hieroglyphics, which could be written in rows or columns, heretic was always written in rows and read from right to left. Oh, I see a braid too, Yolanda. So this helped them write faster. They wrote from the right side to the left side. In China, do you write from right to left or left to right? Which way do you write? Do you start on the left side of your paper or do you start on the right side of your paper? Left to right, duh, okay. Well, not everybody does. In Egypt, they wrote from right to left. Now, when you learn English and you learn to write in English, do you learn to write cursive or just printing? So if I write the word China, this is printing. Now, this is a little hard with my mouse, so I am doing my best. Now, cursive means I connect my letters. Do you guys know what cursive means? Have, do you, have you seen cursive before? So in 
English, I could also say China in cursive. Whoops, it's hard to do with my mouse. So I would connect my letters like this. So there's the word China in very bad cursive because it's hard to do on here. I wonder if I can do it a little better like this if I use my finger. Still kind of hard rather than, so that's cursive. So they had their own cursive, right? They had their own cursive that they used. Oh, Lisa, you can write your name in cursive? Very cool. I like writing in cursive. I like it better when I can use a pen though and not, um, not this, right? It's a little harder with the mouse. Cursive is fun. All right. So for many years, no one could read hieroglyphics. The discovery of the Rosetta Stone in 1799 changed that. On the stone was the same piece of text written in hieroglyphics, a later Egyptian writing called Demotic and Ancient Greek. By comparing the three, experts figured out what the different hieroglyphics meant. Ooh, William, you can write your name in cursive too. That is awesome. All right, ancient graffiti. All right, so this is the Rosetta Stone. It's an official announcement honoring the Pharaoh Ptolemy V, or the fifth. Examples of ancient writing can be seen all over Egypt. Hieroglyphics are carved onto pillars, columns, and obelisks, as well as the stone walls of pyramids and temples. They recount the history of Egypt and its people by recording great battles, political events, prayers to the gods, and praise for the pharaohs. So, Written communications were something that the Egyptians did that made them geniuses. Here's another cool thing that they did. Papyrus. Before the Egyptians created papyrus sheets, people wrote on tablets made of stone or clay or on pieces of wood or animal, stone, or animal skin. When other civilizations discovered the Egyptians' clever invention, it caused a writing revolution. What do you think papyrus is? Does anybody know? Have you learned about it before? Has anybody learned about papyrus before? It's like paper, right? Papyrus is a tall plant that grows in the marshy areas. Yes, writing something smooth like paper uh, along the banks of the Nile River. Inside papyrus is um, the papyrus stalk is a strong fibrous material that can be peeled into strips using a sharp tool. To make papyrus sheets, strips from the stalk were laid out in two layers, one across the other. Um, they were pressed and dried. Once the dried, the sheets were often joined together to create long scrolls. So this is what they did. They peeled it and stuck it together, and then it became paper. The outer green skin was sliced off the stem. Thin slices of the pith inside the papyrus stem were placed in two layers, one on top of the other. The layers were beaten with a mallet to help the fibers bond together. And then they could write on it. Why would that be better than writing on stone, do you think? Do you think it would take a long time to carve things into stone? and you'd have to be strong, right? And what else? If you wanted to write on something and bring it somewhere, would it be heavy to carry the stone? I think so. Priceless papyrus. For 3000 years, papyrus was very valuable in the ancient world. Yes, yeah, stone is very slippery too, Lisa, that's true. Everyone wanted it and the Egyptians exported it all over the Mediterranean region. So they made it and they sent it to other civilizations. So they were, they were able to trade. This trade was very important to Egypt. To ensure that other civilizations could not make it for themselves, the Egyptians kept the method of making papyrus a closely guarded secret. Do you think it was a good idea to keep it a secret how they did it? What do you think? 
I think it was pretty smart because then nobody else could make it and they needed the Egyptians to make it, don't you? Copies of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, a book of spells were written on papyrus scrolls. I think their art is beautiful. Brainwave, the Egyptians needed something they could use to write on papyrus sheets. They created a type of black ink out of vegetable gum, beeswax, and soot. To make different colors, they replaced the soot with a different ingredient. For example, a type of clay called ochre was used to make a reddish color. And you can see they use the reddish color a lot. And it's very beautiful. All right. Here's something else they were good at, farming. Most ordinary Egyptians were farmers, so it's not surprising they invented many things to help them farm more efficiently. The old fashioned way. One of the most important jobs for a farmer was breaking up the soil to make it ready to plant crops. Most ancient civilizations, including the Egyptians, um, uh, used hand plows to prepare the soil. Hand plows had to be made small and light so farmers could carry them. Hand plowing was slow backbreaking work. The Egyptians realized that plowing would be much easier if they, had, if they used animals. So they des designed a plow that could be attached to oxen. The oxen could pull a plow through the earth much more quickly than a human could. Workers would follow behind the plow, breaking up large chunks of soil with hoes. Seeds were then planted in the furrows and the plants and the, the plow created. This wooden model dating from 2040 to 1750 BC shows an Egyptian farmer with his ox drawn plow. That's very smart to use animals, right? Both the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians in Western Asia believed to have invented the sickle about the same time. A sickle was a farming tool with a curved blade, usually made from flint, um, and it was attached to a wooden handle. At harvest time, farmers moved through their fields, swinging the sickle from side to side to cut down crops such as wheat and barley. The Egyptians were also among the first to make other farming equipment such as hoes and rakes. They also made winnowing baskets, which were used to separate grain from chaff. The mixture was thrown in the air, the wind blew away the chaff and the grains were caught in the basket. So this wall painting from a tomb in Thebes shows scenes of harvesting crops. So it shows the sickle down here, All right? So let's look. This curved piece was a blade attached to a wooden handle called a sickle and they would swing it and it would cut what they needed. It would cut down their crops. And here were the winnowing baskets. They were pretty smart, weren't they? They were more than a little smart. All right, so it says, test of time. Modern versions of the Egyptian ox drawn plow are still used by farmers in developing regions of Africa and Asia. And sickles are still in use too. But they had a problem because it was hot and dry in Egypt. In the dry desert, it was essential to find ways of getting water to fields for crops to grow. Now here we might use a hose or a sprinkler system, but they didn't have that. The Egyptians came up with such ingenious irrigation methods that other cultures, including the ancient Greeks and Romans began to use them. The vital Nile. Every year rains to the south caused the Nile River in Egypt to flood. This was crucial to ancient Egyptians. Yes, Egypt is the gift of the Nile River. That is very true. Um, it was crucial to ancient Egyptian agriculture because when the flood water receded, it left behind a rich soil that was perfect for growing crops. Good soil was important, but crops also needed to be watered as they were growing. The ancient Egyptians had to find ways of getting water to fields located further away from the Nile. The Nile flood is still an important event for the Egyptians. It is celebrated by a festival in August every year. To keep the flood water near their fields, the Egyptians built reservoirs out of mud bricks. These trapped the water as it receded. All right, also canals. 
To control the flow of water, farmers created canals by digging trenches from the river all the way to their fields. These canals also filled up during the flood, providing a store of water for the dry season. However, there was still a problem. Um, how could the farmers lift the water out of the canals to use on their fields? They solved this problem with a device called a shaduf. And I see Yolanda put that. The shaduf consisted of a long pole balanced on a crossbeam. A bucket was attached um, to a rope at one end and the shorter end was a counterweight. The farmer pulled on the rope to lower the bucket into the canal. When the bucket was full of water, the farmer raised it again by pulling on the counterweight. The pole could be swung around, allowing water to be poured where it was needed. This painting from a tomb of the sculptor employee at Luxor shows a farmer using a shadu. Sometimes a series of shadoofs were mounted on, on one above the other. This system allowed water to be raised to higher level in, levels in stages. Do you think that was really smart? I think it's very, very smart. Yolanda, did you learn that in school? All right, here's something else that was important that they came up with. Calendars. The annual flooding of the Nile River was essential to the rhythm of life in ancient Egypt. To know when the floods would take place and to plan their farming year, the Egyptians needed an accurate calendar. All right, eyes to the sky. The pattern of life in ancient Egypt was based on the natural cycles of the sun and the moon. The Egyptians used a lunar calendar based on the phases of the moon to keep track of important religious festivals and events. However, they needed to measure everyday life in a different way. The star they called um, Sodput, Sopted, now known as Sirius, appeared in the eastern sky every year at the same time as the flooding. Um, of the Nile River. They use this event as the basis for a solar calendar. All right, the, Den uh, the Dendera Zodiac is an ancient Egyptian temple carving, showing the pattern of constellations in the night sky. What are constellations? Do we know what constellations are? Anybody know what a constellation is? I need to raise my chair, my chair came down. Constellations are patterns of stars in the sky. So, do you see how they had the stars behind them? All right, in ancient Egypt, a week was 10 days, a month was three weeks, and a season was four months. This calendar is carved on the wall of a temple in the complex at Karnak. So, it's in boxes, kind of like the calendars we use today. Three seasons. Today we have four seasons. In ancient Egypt, life was so closely tied to farming that they divided the year into three seasons. Um, three, these seasons corresponded to the important periods in the farming year. Inundation was the period when the Nile River flooded, growing, and harvest. Each season was made up of four months of 30 days. This calendar added up to 360 days. Okay, so how many days are in our calendar now? What do we use now? How many days, do you guys know? Does anybody know? It's 365 and one fourth, yes, 365.25. And where did we get that? Where do we, how did we figure that out? 365.25, yeah, is the number of days it takes the earth to orbit around the sun. So that's pretty impressive, right? That they came so close in 360 days. The 365 day calendar the Egyptians eventually recognized their solar year was too short because the months were no longer matching up with their seasons. To fix this, they added five extra days between harvest and inundation. 
three day, these days became religious holidays set aside to honor the birthdays of different gods. They were very smart. Test of time. The year, a year is actually 365 and one quarter days long. The Egyptians had not accounted for the fraction, so the calendar became increasingly inaccurate. In 238 BC, um, Ptolemy III added an extra day every four years. We still use the system today known as a leap year, where an extra day is added into February every four years. So every four years, we have an extra day because it's 365 and a quarter days. So every four years, we end up with an extra one. And that is February the 29th. I have a friend who was born on February 29th. So what do you think that means for him? What happens, his birthday only happens every four years, right? Wouldn't that be crazy? Because in the three years in between, there is no February 29th. All right, I know it is weird. So clocks, can you believe all the Egyptians invented? Calendars help the ancient Egyptians keep track of annual events but they also wanted to keep accurate time throughout the day. This was particularly important for priests and the regular performance of religious ceremonies. Sunshine and shadow. One of the first methods of ancient, that ancient Egypt, um, Egyptians used to measure time was the shadow clock. The sun struck the shadow clock um, on a gnomon. Based on the length and position of the shadow cast by the gnomon, people could tell the time of day. Over time, the Egyptians developed shadow clocks into more sophisticated sundials. An Egyptian sundial had 12 lines marked on the base, um, uh, radiating from the center. The Egyptians knew what time of day it was by which line the shadow fell on. That's pretty smart, huh? Now, um, let's see, time drips by. Using a sundial was all very well on a bright sunny day, but how did the Egyptians tell time at night or when it was overcast? They used a water clock. This was usually a stone bowl or a cone-shaped vessel. It had a tiny hole in the bottom and evenly spaced markings up the sides. The container was filled with water, which dri dripped out through the hole at a constant rate. So the passing of time could be measured by looking at the water level against the markings. Many water clocks had 12 columns of marking inside, one, one for each month. The ancient Egyptians used obelisks as a type of sundial. They noted how the shadow moved around the surface of the obelisk throughout the course of the day. From this, they could figure out the longest and shortest days of the year. When is the longest day of the year? Does anybody know? When does the longest day of the year happen? when it stays light the longest. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere, and we do in China and in the US, actually, um, right, the longest day of the year, when it stays light the longest is in um, the very end of June. Usually June 21st is the longest day of the year. So starting, um, on June 21st, there's a little less sunlight every day until you come all the way around to the winter solstice, and that's in December. And December is the least light of the day, and then the days start to get longer. Kind of interesting. Okay, now here's another crazy thing, mummification, all right? We know a lot about the kinds of medical problems the ancient Egyptians suffered from. This is largely thanks to their expertise in preserving the bodies of the dead. The ritual of mummification was extremely important in Egyptian society. Essentials for the afterlife. The ancient Egyptians believed that for someone to reach the afterlife, their body had to be preserved. So the bodies of the wealthy, important people were mummified. Afterward, the body was placed in a tomb with all of the things the person might need in the next life, including clothes, jewelry, 
household items, and food. Um, ordinary people were simply buried in the desert where dry sand often preserved their bodies naturally. The ancient Egyptians believed that Anubis, the god of the dead, weighed someone's heart when they died. This was done to judge whether they could pass into the afterlife. In this scene from the Book of the Dead, Anubis is on the left and, and in the middle. All right, so this is Anubis and this is Anubis. Do you think how much your heart weighs has anything to do with when, um, what happens to you after you die? I don't think so. Wow. Making a mummy. First, the body was washed to purify it for the afterlife. Then all of the organs except the heart were removed from the body. Most of the organs were preserved in special containers which were buried with the person. Drying out. The body was filled with a type of stuffing and covered with a natural salt called natron. This dried out the body. It was left for 40 to 50 days after which the stuffing was removed and replaced with either cloth or sawdust. Bandages were wound around the body before it was placed in a stone coffin called a sarcophagus. Some bodies have been so well preserved that even thousands of years later, they are recognizably human. Look at that, you can tell exactly what the person looked like. It took about 70 days to preserve a body. During the process of mummification, the priest wore a mask which represented the god Anubis, so like this. Now, um, priests did not want to cut open the skull of a deceased person. To remove the brain, they inserted a special hook up the nose and pulled the brain out through the nasal passage. Unlike most organs, the brain was not preserved. Now, I have a movie or a little video on mummies. Would you guys like to see the um, brain pop video on mummies? Do you guys like videos? All right, so let's um, stop sharing for a second and let me pull up the, make sure I have the video ready. I think everyone likes videos. So I will make sure that we're ready and then I will share it again. All right, so here we go. I can't believe you convinced me to intern with you at this creepy old museum. What's that? There's no wind in here. Dear Tim and Moby, How did Egyptians make mummies? From Horace. Well, why don't we show you? Moby? Um, is he? Ah, okay then. The Egyptians believed that after a person died, their spirit, or ka, faced a series of trials. They had to travel through the duat, the land of the dead, to reach the afterlife. The duat was filled with dense forests, lakes of fire, and demons. Your spirit had to pass through twelve gates. Each one was guarded by a different demon or monster. To get past them, you had to say a magic spell that included the demon's secret name. After the twelve trials, your soul faced its final judgment before the major gods. This was the ritual known as the weighing of the heart. The heart was set on a scale, opposite a single feather of Ma'at, goddess of truth and justice. If you lived a good life, your heart would be light, while bad deeds made the heart heavy. If the heart was heavier than the feather, it would be devoured. Your soul would remain in the duat forever. But if it was light, the soul could enter Aru, or paradise. It would be reunited with its body to enjoy the afterlife. You'd meet up with loved ones, and there was no more pain or suffering. It was like a perfect version of Egypt, with lush vegetation and flowing rivers. Uh, yeah, there's just one little hitch. Your soul had to complete the journey through Duat before your body decomposed. 
That's why the Egyptians developed a process called mummification. It was a way to preserve the body and buy the soul some time on its journey through Duat. Only special priests could mummify a body. They had to know the right rituals and prayers that went with each step of the process. The first step was to wash and purify the body, rubbing it with sacred oils. This would make the body smell nice, or at least cover up the smell of decay a bit. <laughs> Tickles, huh? Well, this next part won't. A special hook was inserted through the nose to pull out the brain. This was a tricky operation. One false move, and you could damage the face. Then the soul might not recognize the body, and they couldn't reunify to enter Aru. Ah, don't worry. I'm sure they'll give up soon. Next up, the priests made a cut in the left side of the body. They pulled out the internal organs through here. These were preserved separately and stored in jars buried with the body. All except the heart. The soul would need it for its final challenge in Duat. Removing the internal organs prepared the body for the next step. Getting filled and covered with natron. That's a kind of salt found in dried up Egyptian lake beds. Like table salt, it's a preservative. It prevents decay, mainly by killing germs and drying things up. Hundreds of pounds of natron were needed to do the job. Once the body was covered, it was left out in the desert for 40 days. Oh, hey, how was the desert? Yeah. Thanks for your patience. After 40 days in the desert, the body would be completely dried out. The priests would clean all the natron off, stuff the body with linen or sand to help keep a lifelike shape, add some herbs to keep that new mummy smell, plus coat it in a sweet-smelling tree resin, which also kept out moisture. Finally, the mummy was given some makeup to make it look as lifelike as possible. This part of the process took another 30 days. At that point, the body was mummified, and it was time to dress it. The priests carefully wrapped it in linen bandages, including individual wraps for fingers and toes. Amulets, magic charms to ward off evil, were tucked in specific places, and a scroll, now known as the Book of the Dead, was placed in its hands. It contained spells to help the soul cross Duat. A lifelike death mask was fitted over the face and the mummy was placed in an elaborately decorated coffin, or a series of them for rich people and royalty. Then the whole thing went into a sarcophagus, a big stone burial box, which, for pharaohs, Egyptian kings and queens, might be housed in a pyramid. Just a tasteful little memorial to see you off into the afterlife. The whole process took 70 days, and it was extremely expensive. Only the super wealthy could afford it. Regular folks who wanted a chance to reach Aru used natural mummification. Their bodies were wrapped in old linens and buried in the desert. The hot, dry air did a pretty good job of preserving the remains. In fact, some are better preserved than the fancy mummies of the rich. Uh, Moby? Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually scared. Oh. Ah, mummy. Help. Ah. I like Tim and Moby. I think they're funny. Do you guys like Tim and Moby? All right, so 70 days. That was a long time, don't you think? All right, so let's go back to our book. All right, here's something else they did, medicine. Just like people today, the Egyptians had accident, um, accidents and coughs and they caught diseases. Not only did they discover several new ways of treating illnesses, they were also pioneers in a, in a number of different surgical procedures. Herbal medicine. The ancient Egyptians suffered from a whole range of diseases including arthritis, tuberculosis, and tooth decay. Like many ancient civilizations, they turned to nature to treat almost all of these ailments. 
They made medicine from plants and herbs, and um, they often mixed with wine. This wall painting from a tomb shows um, precious ointment being transported in a jar. When doctors could not find any obvious causes of an illness, they would say it was caused by spirits. Spells and magic potions were also used to try and drive these evil, um, evil doers away. All right, healing honey. Honey was a key ingredient in many Egyptian treatments. Today we know that honey has antibacterial properties and the ancient Egyptians noticed that putting honey on wounds prevented or cured infection. They also made a medicine out of honey mixed with wine and milk. Would you wanna put honey on your, on if you cut yourself? What would honey feel like if you put it on your skin? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't like it. I think it would be sticky. Do you guys think it would feel really sticky? Yeah, it tastes good. Surgical advances. The ancient Egyptians were the first people to set bones when they had been broken. Has anybody in here broken a bone before? I have broken my arm playing tag when I was young, actually hide and seek. And I have broken my foot and I had to wear a cast. Um, they, um, they also performed advanced operations such as brain surgery. Yeah, maybe you could lick the honey off at first. No, I am fine now, Yolanda. This was a long time ago when I had broken bones. Um, and cesarean sections to deliver babies. Archaeologists have even found prosthetic body parts. That means if someone um, lost an arm or a leg, they would make um, a new arm or leg out of something else. Many surgical instruments have been discovered, including scalpels. Um, Scalpels are like knives that they have, um, needles for sewing up wounds, scissors, and forceps. Forceps are like um, tongs, like scissors, kind of. These knives may have been used during surgery or for hooking organs out of the body during mummification. Those look kind of scary. I don't think I would want them to use those on me. Would you? I don't think I would like that at all. Looks very scary. All right, dental care. There were no dentists in ancient Egypt, and the Egyptians had to suffer through dental problems such as cavities and abscesses. To limit these problems, they tried to keep their teeth clean in several ways. All right. Um, mummies discovered in ancient Egypt often show signs of worn teeth and mouth diseases. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because they didn't have toothpaste. A recipe for bad teeth. A big problem for ancient Egyptians in terms of oral hygiene was their diet. They ate a lot of bread, but they used stones to grind the flour and pieces of grit and sand often ended up in the finished loaf. These ground down the teeth and wore away the tooth enamel. The test of time, rotting teeth meant bad breath. To hide this, the uh, Egyptians invented the first breath mints um, made of cinnamon, myrrh and frankincense boiled with honey and shaped into lozenges. All over the world today, people suck mints to freshen their breath. Do you have breath mints? Do you, do you ever put a breath mint in your mouth to make your breath better? Like say you don't have your toothbrush with you? Yeah, sure. You don't like mint, Yolanda? I like mint. Picks and brushes. The Egyptians also <clears throat> are credited with inventing toothbrushes although the Babylonians may have come up with the idea at about the same time. These ancient instruments were little more than twigs with the ends deliberately frayed, but they helped remove food from between the teeth to keep the mouth healthier. The Egyptians also used toothpicks to remove food from their teeth after eating a meal. So, long, long ago, they were doing some of the same things people do today. Um, Queen Hesput, is thought to have died from an infection caused by an abscess after she had a tooth removed. That's like a bad infection. This wall painting shows a range of ancient Egyptian food, including bread, fruit, and different meats. 
this rich diet probably contributed to tooth decay. Making toothpaste. A key invention that helped the ancient Egyptians keep their mouths healthy was toothpaste. At first, they used ground up ox hooves, burnt eggshells, ashes, and a volcanic rock called pumice, which created a slightly gritty paste that polished teeth and kept them clean. I like the toothpaste I have that tastes minty. These were not tasty ingredients, though. It was only during the period of Roman rule that the Egyptians started making nicer flavored toothpaste out of salt, dried flowers, and mint. Cosmetics. Who knows what cosmetics are? Like makeup? The ancient Egyptians took great pride in their appearance. Fine clothing, valuable jewelry, and carefully applied makeup were signs that someone was a member of Egyptian high society. All in the eyes. The Egyptians are believed to invent an eye makeup more than 4,000 years ago. It became a constant feature of their appearance. Their makeup was usually either black or green. Black was made from lead and green was made from copper or a green mineral called malachite. These were mixed with another mineral called galena to make a sort of paint. This box contains ancient Egyptian cosmetics believed to, um, that the Egyptians believed makeup prevented disease and both men and women wore it. Wigs. Head lice could be a problem in ancient Egypt, so to keep them away, people shaved their heads. To replace the hair they had lost, wealthy people wore wigs. These were woven from real hair and wood wool from sheep. They were set in shape using beeswax. Um, although most people wore wigs if they could afford them, priests remained bald, as it was felt they were kept pure this way. In fact, priests may have shaved their whole bodies. Shaving implements. The ancient Egyptians, Egyptians also shaved their facial hair and may have been responsible for creating the first razors. Ancient shaving instruments made from sharpened stones and set in wooden handles have also been discovered in Egypt. Despite shaving, they also made, uh, made fake beards with the same, same material as wigs. Pharaohs usually wore ceremonial beards. Even the female pharaoh, um, was sometimes depicted wearing beards in paintings and statues. The shape of someone's beard indicated their social status. Pharaohs wore their beards, beards with square ends. The Egyptians are, are credited with creating the style of hand mirror we still use today. These were made from metal such as bronze, which was polished to a high shine so users could see their reflections. The mirrors were also expensively decorated. Ancient Egyptian razor and mirror. Can you believe that all this stuff dates back thousands of years? All right, and that is it. So here's our timeline. 7,000 BC, people first began to settle along the banks of the Nile. 3,500 BC, two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt exist. 3,100 BC, the kingdoms are united under King Narmer 2686 BC, start of the period known as the Old Kingdom. 2050 is the start of the BC is Middle Kingdom. And in 1567, it was the start of the New Kingdom. In 712 BC, the Late Period begins. And in 30 BC, Egypt comes under Roman control. And that was over 2,000 years ago. And that is all. What um, what would you like to ask me? Does anyone have any questions about the Egyptians? Go back to the beginning and look at the picture on the front. All right, there we go. What questions do we have about Egyptians? Um, I have one question about the mummies that you have taught yes. uh, taught today, which is about the mummies in there like why people now open it but find there was nothing in there but there was nobody could have um get into the egyptians pyramids but how can they find that there were no bodies in the pyramids and they think somebody steal it well i think that maybe long ago someone did get in 
um, they do think that someone came in and robbed them. And one reason that they would rob the, um, the pyramids is because they always buried people with all the things they thought they would need. And somehow they thought they might need gold or riches or jewels, um, very expensive things um, in the afterlife. So the, the pyramids were full of things people might want to take that were valuable. And so they think much later, people robbed those tombs and stole the things. I think that's awful, don't you? Yeah, I think that was awful too. Yeah, I think people should not have done that. Thanks, thank, thank, thank you. You're welcome. Answering. Well, I certainly enjoyed talking to you guys today. And I hope to see you again soon.